We took a, a worthwhile detour last Sunday. It was Resurrection Sunday, and wasn't it a great day? This is a powerful day. We had, we had a couple services. We had lots of people here, and God just did some incredible things. And we, we journeyed through the 40 days with Jesus that he, that he spent on the earth after, after his resurrection, and, and we, we discovered how important those days were. And I mentioned one of the last commandments was that, that people be water baptized, and we had all sorts of people say, I've never been water baptized. They need to get water baptized. That was actually a commandment by the Lord, you know, on that, on that great, great commission. But one, one, of those, one of those instructions were to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we realize that that's an important step in our journey, and we had a lot of people sign up. So I'm looking forward to that day, and I'm looking forward, forward to more of you. If you have not been water baptized and you're a believer, you need to get wet. You need to take the plunge. No little sprinkle or spray around here. You get plunged. The old man dies in that water and comes out with res- resurrection life. Amen? So it was, a good, it was a good detour, but before that, the Sunday before, Jesse was close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm actually going to be concluding it, but he talked about um, judgment, the same measure that we use to judge others is going to be used on us, kind of a, a sobering reality. And I'm going to close out the message the way Jesus closed out his sermon, and I'm going to talk about two paths, two voices, two types of disciples, and two foundations. Jesus ends his teaching, and I think it's a pretty incredible summary of his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you don't, if this is your first Sunday and you haven't been in these teachings or you're a little bit unfamiliar with the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount primarily was targeted, the target audience, and it's important, by the way, when you read Scripture, to read it in context. Now, I'm sure that I've taken Scripture out of context, and I've heard a lot of other speakers take Scripture out of context. Now, we can draw a lot of analogies and illustrations, and we can learn that way, but when you're studying Scripture, you really need to read it in context because it has specific meaning for, like, like them presently. There was a present-day reality. It has application to us, but there are certain things that were spoken even to the disciples that don't specifically apply to us. But so it's always important when you're reading to understand who's, who's speaking it, who's sharing it, and, and who the audience is. And I think that if you don't understand who the audience is on the Sermon on the Mount, you can, you can lose, lose the powerful punch in what Jesus was trying to communicate to a primarily religious community. And Jesus primarily was talking to his disciples and those that were following him. Now, there were those who were a little bit mystified with him and curious about him, didn't know a whole lot about him, but there were teachers of the law there, there were Pharisees there, there were religious people there, and there were his followers, his, his, his disciples who knew who he, who he was, and, and that's why they were following him. So it was a, a religious audience. Many of them were, were his disciples. They were following him because they believed in his teachings. There were some there that were just in awe of who he was and the way that he delivered and unpacked scripture. They were drawn to him because he, he spoke like no other religious person ever spoke. His words gave life. When Peter was asked by Jesus, so are you going to leave me now too? After it was discovered who was going to betray him, are you going to leave me now too? And Peter said, where am I going to go? You have the words of life. I don't think Peter was the only one that experienced that from Jesus' teaching. Somehow his teaching made them alive and gave them, gave them life. It's like, it's like they, they understood the law. They understood the Old Testament scriptures. Really, for the first time, there was a revelation that they received from him. So these were the types of people that were around Jesus. And this is who Jesus was sharing these, these precepts, these values of the kingdom of God. He was teaching about the kingdom of God. So when we read about the narrow and wide gates, it is not talking about non-believers per se. I think when we read that passage of scripture, we think, well, there's many paths to take. You know, there's some people follow this person, some people follow this person, some people follow Buddha, some people follow this person, and then there's, then there's the right path, Jesus. This is not what this passage of scripture is talking about. And I'm going to share with you what it's talking about because I think it's a sober reminder. It helps us to, to reevaluate where we are. Jesus, Jesus was talking to disciples. He was talking to believers. And I believe that this, these passages of Scripture, that's who the audience was then. That's who he wants the audience to be now. This is a message to you, church, as believers. Amen? 
I'm going to ask you to, uh, to stand for the reading of the Word. I'm going to read quite a few scriptures. I'm going to try to read this, read this fast. This is the end of Matthew. I'm going to start with verse 13. We stand for the scripture around here because we honor, honor God, we honor His Word, and we honor truth. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away with me, you evildoers." Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as the one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. You can be seated. It's interesting that Jesus closes with these instructions knowing that there were religious people there. This was a religious audience. They knew about Yahweh God, they knew about the Old Testament scriptures, they knew about what the prophets wrote, they, they, were, they were familiar with some of what Jesus was teaching, but he was expounding on it in a way that they've never heard before. Some were offended, many were drawn in, they were attracted to this, what, what, what Peter said, these, these words somehow bring us life, they, they excite us, there's something in this for, for all of us, no matter what walk of life, no matter what your background, whether you were considered cursed or blessed, there's something in this kingdom for us, and they were excited about this. But many, many were concerned, particularly the religious people. I think many of them were offended by this message, and Jesus was talking to this audience in these passages of Scripture. So we're just going to spend some time just kind of breaking this down. In that first section, it talks about the narrow and wide gates. Now, we know that out in the world today that there are many ways that people reach spiritual enlightenment. They're trying to discover their purpose, why they're here, who created them, why they, why they exist, and they pursue other things. And I, and I think many of you have probably had that in your past. Before you came to Jesus, you were pursuing other things. You had a different worldview. You were living for different things. You know, some of them you would identify as sinful things, but, but, you, I, but you can also think that, I think I was on the spiritual journey. I think I really what I was looking for Jesus, but I looked over there and I tried this and that didn't work. But then I t- tried Jesus and you experienced what Peter experienced. He has the words of life. He brings life. And somehow, somehow I was drawn to him. And I think a true seeker of truth, no matter where you are on that journey, will eventually find Jesus. If you're truly looking for your purpose, why you're here, who created all things, I think people are drawn into Jesus if they're sincere. If they're they're authentically looking looking for truth, you will find the truth because Jesus is truth. Amen? But this, uh, this, he talks about these two roads and he's talking to religious people. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the church today. And he said there's two roads One road is narrow, and the other is broad. And he's saying to the religious community, some find the narrow road, and when you find that, or the narrow gate, and when you find that narrow gate, you go through that gate, and it opens up to a wide experience of freedom in life. 
because he had the words of life. But broad is the gate, and many follow, follow this gate that, that I think is drawn into satisfying the flesh. And it's all, about, it's all about works. Jesus, I believe, wants us to struggle with the tension between our assurance in him, the joy that we experience in him, but also the sober reality that we have to take up our cross daily. This is something that Christians don't like to talk about. We know that even though that we're saved, we still struggle with fleshly desires. We still struggle with sin. Jesus is talking to this audience, and he's trying to drive this reality home that, that I'm going to provide freedom, and I'm going, to, I'm going to provide a power to overcome the temptation, but you're going to have to grapple with this as long as you're here. And you're going you're gonna to have to take up your cross, and you're going to experience persecution. Jesus didn't hide this from the disciples and he doesn't hide it from the disciples today. And he doesn't hide it from the church. This is a message for the church today. Jesus is saying that there's a road that looks right, but it's not right. You know, I look out in the world today, and I look in the church community, and I, I'm concerned. Jesus, we're going to touch on this when we talk about false prophets, but Jesus is not talking about, about teachers or ideas that, you know, we all make mistakes. Sometimes we see through filters. You know, that's, that's not what this is talking about. Jesus is talking, talking to people who go down a road of fulfilling pleasure, and it's about them. They want to be exalted. They want these gifts. And Jesus said they experience supernatural things around them, but Jesus said, I do not know you. I don't know you. These are church people. This is speaking to, to teachers in the church, pastors in the church. He's speaking to the church. The church is the primary audience here. And he's saying there's a, there's a road that's broad, and a lot of people go down that road. There's a lot of people in the church that go down that road. Now, what I do not want to do today is create the suspicion in you. You're looking and examining, and you should examine everything that's said. You should examine everything that's preached. You should examine it with the word of God. You should make sure that it lines up with the word of God. You shouldn't just take my word for it. You should be studying the word on your own. I can lead you in the right direction, but I can't feed you. Jesus feeds you. The Holy Spirit feeds you. You have, to, you have to make sure my words line up with Scripture, and if they don't, there's a way that you deal with that. And it's not on Facebook. It's not to publicly humiliate. You go to that person lovingly, and you talk to them about it. But there are people in the church, there are pastors and preachers in the church teaching false doctrine. But it says, it says in these passages of Scripture, you're going to be confused because they look good on the outside. They're charismatic. People, lots of people go to their church. People are falling out. They're being slain in the spirit. People are getting healed, and it's confusing. He's saying they, they look, they're wolves. They're wearing sheep, a sheep costume, but they're really ferocious wolves inside. This is the whole context of this passage of Scripture. Jesus says, I've come to give life, and down that narrow road, you will find life. Life is zoe. It's the Greek word zoe, and it means it means life given by God through Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's this, this journey, this road that you find yourself on. If Jesus is at the end of the road, then you will have life. But Jesus doesn't hang out where, where men want to be self-inflated, where men and women want, women want to draw attention to themselves, where they, where they want to promote ministry, where they just want to get people in the door. And they don't share certain things in the gospel because they're afraid to offend people. They're afraid to talk about certain things. Peter said in 2 Peter 1.3, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance that the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, that his divine power has given us everything that we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us into his glory and goodness. Down that path, if, it's, if you don't find Jesus, then you're finding something else that's unchristlike and it's ungodly and will only bring attention to yourself. You'll end up serving yourself or others or something else, but you won't be serving Jesus. When you serve Jesus, you go and you bring your cross with you. 
and you realize that you have to die to self. That's what that water baptism represents, the death of the old man, the resurrection of the new. And the new man is not about, is not about promoting self. The new man walks in the character of Christ. The new man exalts Christ. If you're following a ministry where the ministry doesn't talk about Jesus much, but it talks about everything else that the church is doing or that the leaders are doing, I'd get away from that place. Then he goes in and he talks about true, what the difference between the true and false prophets are, which gives validity to prophecy, but there are false prophets in the church. And these false prophets, I've, I've heard accusations People calling other people false prophets because they have a different end time theology. That is not what this passage of scripture is talking about. There are certain things that, that are non-negotiable and that's around Jesus. He's the son of God. He's the savior, the Trinity. Those are, those are the major things. Those are the non-negotiables. But there are some things that are negotiable and I see people throwing around this, he's a false prophet because he doesn't have the same opinion as that other person who's accusing him of of being a false prophet. That's not what this passage of scripture is talking about. This is talking about someone who's perverting grace. Come to me for, come to me for repentance. You don't have to come to God. They're, 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 they're saying that there is no hell. There is no final judgment of sin. Those, those would, I, I think, all of us would consider false prophets, but those are the type of false prophets that this passage of Scripture is talking about. He said they wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They're, they're people that regularly promote falsehood, and, and they promote it so often and so much they begin to believe the falsehood. I don't think they start out that way. I don't think they start out deceived. I think they they intend, they're ferocious wolves. They intend to manipulate. They intend to deceive. They intend to devour the sheep. That's why the the illustration, the picture is a ferocious wolf. But eventually, I mean, I think we're all familiar with this. When When you share a lie so many times, it's hard to tell which is the lie and which is the truth. You ever experience that? Tell a story so much, you know, the big story about, you know, you caught a bigger fish than you did. You tell it so much, you pretty, pretty soon you're not sure what story is correct anymore. I believe, I believe that, that eventually you can fall into such deceit. You, you can't tell the difference between truth or untruth. There are people that distort the teachings of Scripture. And there is an assumption here that truth can be distorted. And, I, and we need to be discerning and aware of this, that there are people in the church that are distorting truth. I hear about it often. I hear students talking about it that are going to Christian colleges and their Bible professors are, 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 are speaking things that are anti-biblical in their Bible professors. There are people there that are distorting truth because they want, they want the appeal of the masses. They, they want to be politically correct or they don't want to offend people so they leave out portions of the gospel or they say certain things that are called sin in scripture are not sin. They're calling good evil in evil good and they're in the church. They're in our schools and we're to be aware of them. Now again, if we discover people like this and, and we, we pray that, that God would give us courage to address it, then we go to them privately and we talk to them and you pray before you go but but you go and you talk to him, you'll, you'll know a tree by its fruit. And eventually a false prophet will bear bad fruit. He may be able to trick people a while, for a while, but eventually you'll see the fruit in his life or her life. Then he goes in and he talks and differentiates between what is a true and a false disciple. I mean, you can see that clearly he's talking to the church. He's not talking about people who are unsaved, people outside the church. He's talking about people within the church, within that religious community. There are true disciples and there are false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, these these false disciples move in the spiritual gifts. They prophesy. There's miracles that happen around him. That's a scary thought. And what's even scarier is they'll, when they die and they get to heaven and they're before the judgment of God, 
They're under such deceit, they think that they did a good thing, and Jesus says, I don't know you. And they defend themselves, but I did miracles. I I prophesied. I did good things. I did good works. And Jesus said, I don't know you. There's a path that a believer can go down, and that path often starts with sin, and you not addressing sin in your life. And eventually, no longer, you're, you're not convicted by that sin anymore. I've experienced some of these things. So I, I know what I'm talking about. You can, you can tolerate certain things in your life, whether it's a bitterness or some sort of addiction or, or, or offense or unforgiveness. You tolerate those things in your life and you risk becoming one of these things. Jesus is not going to leave these things alone in your life. He wants you to address them because he loves you and he wants you to live the Zoe life. But if you leave it alone, eventually you don't get convicted by it anymore and you become like this. You think you're a Christian because you're involved in Bible studies, you, you go to church, the pastor lets you preach every once in a while, you serve on the worship team, you're on an intercessory prayer team, the prophetic team even lets you prophesy every once in a while. He's saying people like this can be so deceived that they think they're doing a good thing, no longer convicted by sin, and he calls them false disciples, just like the false prophets. It's a warning to us all. We can never get to the point in our spiritual walk where we get lazy, we get dull, and we think that we can't, well, I'm never gonna struggle with that again. The Holy Spirit will continue to come to you and refine you and tell you to weed out and cut off certain things in your life. There are certain things, there are certain times that he'll tolerate certain things in your life because he's working on bigger problems. But as those bigger problems go away, he's going to continue that refinement process and he's going to say, this relationship's not a healthy one anymore. You need to stop hanging out with this person. You need to stop going to the bar with this person. You need to stop bowling with this person because they're bringing you down. Every time you're around them, you act differently than you act when you're around church, folks. You know that offense that you have against that brother? I know they did it. I know they did a terrible thing to you. Or that family member that did a, a, a terrible thing to you. By the way, when you forgive someone who did a terrible thing, it doesn't absolve them from the consequences of their action, but it releases you from bondage. You are required to forgive like Jesus forgive you. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we've all, you know, we, we've, We've done terrible things, said terrible things, and had terrible thoughts, yet God forgives us before we asked. He died on a cross before you even existed. And he died for your sin before you committed him. He didn't know about him. I mean, he knew about him, but you didn't know about him. Nobody knew about you. You got to forgive like Jesus forgives. You got to let that thing go. And I realize it's traumatic and it's difficult, but you have to walk through that process. Otherwise, you risk being one of these false disciples. And Jesus doesn't want that. If you're in a healthy community, eventually those those things will bubble up and they'll be dealt with because God's a loving father. And he's got greater things in store for you and he's provided everything that you need for life and godliness, which is why he doesn't leave you alone. These false disciples settle on a certain lifestyle. They just have like this casual relationship with the Lord. You know, I'm a Christian. You know, I go to church, but it's just casual. But in their private times and in their mind, they think completely different things. They struggle with completely different things, but they hide it. I want you to know I'm not up here pointing a finger at you. As I started reading through this, the Lord started to bubble up certain things in my life and I started to get convicted. This message should be convicting for us all. I guarantee you have not arrived. That there's still stuff in your life that the Lord wants to remove and grow you in. Never get into a place where you think that you've arrived. God is using me in such a powerful way. You forget that he's not done with you. That he still wants to refine you. He still wants you to look more like him. Then he starts to talk about the foundations that we build things on. The wise and the foolish builders. 
Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built himself on a rock. Put these things into practice and you'll build a sure foundation. Jesus will be the sure foundation under your feet. If not, Jesus will not be the foundation. And when pressure comes, when temptation comes, that temptation to to run when you have to stand, that temptation to close your mouth when you're supposed to speak, eventually it will come and you will be tested. Jesus promises us that. If your sure, if your foundation isn't sure, if it's not Christ, if it's just about your religious duty and your religious exercise, eventually that foundation will crumble, and so will you. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. And I'm telling you, the winds are blowing. The winds are blowing out there. The Lord's bringing refinement. He's bringing alignment to the church. Refinement and alignment is good is as painful as it is. It is good. Some of you are feeling it right now. You're feeling convicted by, because of this message. It's because of the Holy Spirit's beginning to work in your life because he's a good God and he doesn't leave his kids alone. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed. You know what amazed means there? To drive out of one's senses. We think, oh joy, oh joy. That's not what they were doing. It means to drive out of one's senses, they were struck with panic. I don't care who you were in that audience, whether you were a true or whether you were a false disciple, that teaching was a sobering reality. And the reality is that none of us are good. No, not one of us are good. And there were sins that Jesus died for and sins that, that, that we've committed and will commit in the future that Jesus died for. And that's a sobering reality for all. And we should carry that till the day that we die. Jesus died for us, for our sins. And he expects something from true disciples. And he expects us to walk in holiness and in purity. The perverted grace message is, is that there's certain sins, don't worry about it. You're his son, you're his daughter, sin don't matter. That's not true, sin does matter. You could come to the point in your life where you're committing sin, where again, you, 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 become, you become so cold to the Lord that it affects your, you don't even have a relationship with Jesus anymore. I do believe that people can fall away from the faith. Some, I try to wrap my mind around that, but there are people that think they're saved in this message, but they're not. So maybe it's not falling away from the faith. Maybe they were never saved. I don't know what it is, but the picture's clear. You could live a spiritual life and you could operate in the gifts of the Spirit, but still not have the character of Christ in you. And you get to that judgment day and you think that he's going to say, well done and good and faithful servant, but you don't hear those words. You hear, I didn't know you. I don't want to be that kind of disciple. If there's something in your life, deal with it today. Because there's at risk that you could become one of these individuals. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for me? <laughs> I'm not going to do an altar call because this is something that needs to kind of simmer. You need to be a little introspective. You need, to, you need to ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything in me that is causing like this, this wrong filter, this wrong perception of who you are or, that's affecting my relationship? Holy Spirit, out of your compassion and your goodness, can you reveal those things to me so I can begin to deal with it? Lord, refine me. You've got to desire this. This is not something that one altar call is going to be able to deal with. It's going to be something that, that the Lord's going to have to walk, walk you through. So, Lord, Jesus, I just thank you for your love and your compassion for us, your love and your compassion for me. 
your desire is never to embarrass us, to make a spectacle of our sin. But you know that it's something that's going to come between the intimacy that we have with you and you won't leave it alone because you are a loving God. But you don't harass, you don't nag like we do. You lovingly come to us and you just kind of shine a light on it. You don't force us to deal with it because you give us that free will. You want us to be drawn to you. You want us to want you. And I believe that when we turn to you that we'll find the power within us to overcome. To overcome temptation. It says there is no temptation that is uncommon to man. There's no new temptation. It's all been experienced before. But I'll never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And I will always provide a way of escape. We think that we're in bondage as believers, but we're not. That's a lie from the enemy. We might even see the change. We might even feel absolutely crippled. But that's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the pit of hell. If we confess our sins, then you are just enough to forgive us of our sins. And that life, that that spiritual life, that Zoe life will enter us. The spirit of the life in Christ in us will help us to overcome so when that temptation comes again, we take the way of escape. I pray for some that haven't recognized that way of escape, that you would reveal that to them again, that you would soften their hearts, you would soften their hard hearts, and that they would see and they'd hear that way of escape and they would take it and they would understand the power that they can have because of you in their life, that they can be overcomers. They don't have to submit to this thing. It doesn't have to rule their lives and rule their relationships anymore. And we just thank you for your loving kindness to us, that you didn't hide the fact that we're gonna be persecuted, that, th- that it, this walk's not gonna be easy. But you also did not hide that we are going to be rewarded. And that final reward is that one day we will never have to deal with this again. We'll get a new heavenly body and we'll live in a new heaven and earth where there will be no more homicides. There will be no more theft or carjacking or any of that. And sin will be rid of this world. And we will live in that new heavens and the new earth. But in the meantime, we we can live a kingdom reality now if we're willing to submit to you. We just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.